Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We're glad to have you on a Friday morning. I remember talking to the ambassador and we were saying, you know, the only window of opportunity was going to be a Friday. And I said, well, you know what Fridays are like in Washington. Nobody does anything on Fridays in Washington. And I said, I'm a little worried about whether we would be able to have people here. And I'm so glad to have you all here, but I understand why. I think this is a real opportunity. And really look forward to it. First of all, let me just begin to say we have a, when we have uh, events with outside groups, we always start with a little safety announcement. I'm responsible for everybody here, so don't worry. We've not had anything happen since we've been here, but if it does, I'm going to ask you to follow me. We're just going to go out either through the exit to the left or we'll go around the corner. We'll go right out to the street. We'll take uh, two left-hand turns and a right-hand turn. We'll meet over at National Geographic, and I'll get all of you into this exhibit on the Queens of Egypt. It's a great show. It's a wonderful, interesting show. You'll enjoy it, but nothing's going to happen. Um, it's a real privilege to have Minister uh, come out here. It is, uh, we don't hear enough from Portugal, to be candid. And I, I tell my friends, we're not going to focus on you unless you come here and make us listen. So it's a real opportunity when a, a senior minister will come to Washington because it forces us out of our daily wacky debates and think about fundamentals again. And of course, Portugal was, was a founding member of NATO, has always been kind of very important intellectually as a pivot for us to understand both the southern dimensions of NATO, which tend to get under, undervalued in a NATO context, especially since we were so preoccupied by the North German plains for all those years. We really did undervalue. Now the focus is very much on the Mediterranean. And, uh, and Portugal's been very instrumental in helping us think about that. And of course, it's an Atlantic country. And so it has been a partner with us in every part of how America has worked with NATO in the Atlantic. And it's again, we just want to say thank you for being such an important and steady friend. If you look at Portugal's engagement, they are in every NATO obligation that's underway right now. And you really do have to say it's a serious sacrifice on behalf of Portugal to have such a broad presence across the line. And it just it reflects again the intellectual commitment that the people of Portugal have to Europe and to a solid and peaceful future for Europe and partnership with the United States. And we're grateful for that. Now, the minister is going to be uh, meeting with uh, Acting Secretary Shanahan a few minutes later, so it's not fair to ask him what he's going to talk about. Okay? If it was after the meeting, then he could decide what he wants to share with us. So it's not fair to ask him about it. But I think you can ask almost anything else. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with, uh, you know, some framing observations. The minister is, is willing to give us some framework of how he's thinking of pro problems this year. This is always helpful because it'll help us. And then he's going to be open for a conversation that Rachel is going to lead. And we're going to bring all of you into it. So I think it's, a, it's really... Uh, a great opportunity. So could I ask you, with your genuine and warm applause, to welcome Minister Cravino to the stage and say thank you for coming to be with us today. Thank you. Well, good morning. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much to uh, John Hammery, to uh, Rachel Ellerhurst for, for their invitation. Uh, it's wonderful to be back in Washington. This is a city where um, my wife and I spent some very enjoyable time with our one-year-old daughter 19 years ago. Uh, so uh, so it's, uh, it's always great to return, and especially on a beautiful day such as this. As John mentioned, I thought that um, uh, the most useful perhaps would be not so much to go into any kind of depth in the uh, initial uh, introductory remarks, but to outline some of the main challenges that I think we're facing. Um, I was thinking, listening to John, actually, I don't have too much to say here about, uh, about Portugal, but delighted to, uh, to do so if, uh, if any of you would like. So I'll, I'll just uh, outline some of the main uh, issues that I think that we're all grappling with or that need to be grappled with uh, for a few minutes and then sit down and get to the point that 
uh, I'm most looking forward to, and probably you as well, which is uh, some interactivity. So challenges. I've uh, identified here uh, six. Um, perhaps it's a rather short, short list. Uh, could have identified quite a few more, but, uh, but let's start with these uh, six. And I would say that the first one that I have here is understanding and being consequential about the, uh, the geopolitical relevance of the transatlantic uh, relationship. Um, Europe obviously has lost some centrality in uh, US strategic thinking over the past uh, years, uh, decade or so, uh, with uh, a little bit of um, a return to concern about Europe uh, following the annexation of, of Crimea. But uh, in a longer time perspective, there has been this decline of attention uh, to Europe as, as uh, the US focuses more and more on the Pacific and the rise of China is uh, obviously makes that, that easy to understand. Um, the point that I would wish to uh, underline uh, here re with relation to that is very simply that as global geopolitical dynamics shift. The US still has, uh, on the one hand, uh, a lot of security interests at stake in the stability, with respect to stability of Europe, and on the other hand, has in Europe um, a friend or a set of friends, uh, unlike anywhere else in the world. Uh, there is nowhere else in the world that the US is likely to uh, find as close a relationship as it has with the countries on the other side of the Atlantic. Meaning that even as geopolitical, uh, global geopolitical dynamics shift, it's useful to be thinking here in Washington about how Europe can be, work closely with the US, even when we're thinking about Asia, not to mention Africa, a point that I'll come to a little later, and other parts of the world. And I think that uh, it has been, there has been something of a neglect of Europe in that Europe has been thought of only as an arena of confrontation with the Soviet Union in those times, rather than as a, a group of allied countries that, uh, that can have a lot more to offer than simply being a buffer to, uh, to the Soviet Union. So that was one point, understanding and being consequential about the geopolitical relevance of the transatlantic relationship. Second point, as you'll see, I'm jumping about a bit here. Managing Brexit. This is something that we are um, facing, of course, now in Europe. Uh, the last two and a half years have been, three years now, have been very much, uh, far too much energy, I would say, has been dedicated to this. We have uh, a, a widespread and, I would say, consensual view that Brexit um, shouldn't have a negative impact in terms of the uh, security relationship, either between the UK and Europe, European Union, or, uh, or in a wider sense, um, a negative impact upon the transatlantic relationship. So we're all agreed about that. The problem is that, uh, as we have seen uh, rather um, exuberantly, I would say, in the case of Brexit, you can have objectives, and then you have process and results, and the relationship between the three, it's uh, it's, it's, not, it's not been there uh, in the Brexit scenario. So the fact that we have a consensus about what we want does not give us a guarantee about what we're going to get. We have to be working hard on ensuring that Brexit is not destabilizing for the transatlantic relationship, for uh, European security. It won't, uh, it won't happen just by itself. And in fact, with the nature, the unpredictable nature of Brexit dynamics, uh, it can, that can uh, derail. A third issue or set of issues, managing the, the rise of uh, China. Point here is that, uh, well, certainly, China is rising rapidly. Uh, it's come upon us like a tidal wave in the last uh, few years. There has been a sudden uh, awareness of something that has actually been building for for a long time. Now, I think it would be a mistake to look upon this in an exclusively confrontational manner. There are certainly confrontational elements there that have to be taken into account. But it's not, it would be very um, reductionist to focus only on 
how we can confront, stop. China is not the new Soviet Union. There is no, uh, it will be very unhelpful to be tr seeking to establish a parallel between 19, mid-1940s uh, relationship of the out on beginning of the Cold War and the times we're living uh, today. Time, from a European perspective or Portuguese perspective, but I think it's uh, pretty widespread in Europe, China has, China has many things. China is a very important uh, trade partner with a tendency to slowly become a little bit more open. Um, takes a long time. There is certainly not a level playing field when you're negotiating with China or when you're trading with China, but it has become a little more open. And when you're talking of a market of 1.3 billion becoming a little bit more open, obviously that's very attractive. Um, it's a source of foreign investment of various types and various different types of um, sectors of the econo economy. It's a country also where we have a good dialogue and convergence in many cases on matters of global governance, uh, climate change being uh, at the forefront, and this is no, no small thing. Um, it is, however, a partner in these respects, and it's not an ally. And we uh, are quite clear-minded about that. Now, the challenges that we face with respect, for example, to 5G, completely new challenges. These are challenges that are unrelated to anything that we've been living through in the past. And my suggestion here goes back to my first point about the relevance of the transatlantic relationship is we would have a lot to gain if the US and Europe uh, were talking a lot more, engaging much more with each other about the big issues. And then we can talk about whether or not Huawei should be uh, allowed to participate in the 5G infrastructure. And so it's, more, it's important first to have the wider conversation because otherwise it is very difficult to distinguish between what is purely commercial and what is of strategic interest. And the confusion between commercial and strategic interests is, it can be very damaging. A fourth point, uh, Europe's push for a strategic identity. Europe's push for a, a security and defense identity. Now, um, for a number of reasons that are coming together at this particular point, this is a reality. Uh, Europe is in the process of creating a strategic identity of its own, and this means that Europe in five, ten years will have uh, something of a different reality, will be able to operate on the world stage in a manner that is quite different from, from has been in the past. Uh, this characterization of a, Europe as a civilian power uh, that will no longer be, be valid. Now, this, uh, I think there is in Europe, uh, with, with many nuances, but there is a, a general understanding that this should be done in harmony with NATO. 22 out of the 28 EU countries are members of NATO. So, and they're not all schizophrenic. Um, so I think that, uh, that it stands to reason that there is a very strong basis there for the development of Europe's strategic identity in a manner that is not um, contradictory to what all, including the 22, would like for, uh, for NATO. There's a, I think sometimes it's rather unhelpful to go too closely into definitions. At the moment, there is a process going on in Europe about defining exactly what strategic autonomy means. Um, I, my, my take on this, uh, I, I hope it's of, of, of some use, and is, is a very simple one, is that this is a problem of prepositions. We should be talking about strategic autonomy for, and not what comes to mind, strategic autonomy from. Autonomy from what? From US, from NATO. No, it's strategic autonomy for. It's strategic autonomy in, orbit, in order to undertake certain missions, tasks, that others might uh, not be interested in doing. And then when you do that, then you begin to think, well, uh, this is, uh, we do have circumstances that can allow us to play to the best advantage of, of the different institutions. And uh, uh, rather, than, rather than embark upon some kind of uh, confrontational uh, approach. I'm simplifying matters. There's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of commercial interests also involved here, but uh, I think that it's, it would be naive to imagine that Europe can develop a strategic identity of its own without the development also 
consolidation of European defense industries. I think that this is something that in overall should be seen as positive for NATO. Um, but, uh, but of course, again, it's important to distinguish between what is commercial and what is, and what is uh, strategic, even though uh, sometimes they are intertwined. Um, when we're thinking about the EU and NATO relationship, it's important to be kept the two separate. A fifth point, the centrality of the Atlantic. So coming back to, to, to the NATO, the A in NATO. Um, the routes, new routes uh, opening up in the Arctic. Um, new access to uh, the Atlantic from the, the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. And new realities in the Atlantic Ocean, for example, with respect to piracy, with respect to evolving technologies that allow us to be looking at the resources on the seabed, with respect uh, to the challenges of, um, of global warming, the challenges, the environmental challenges, challenges of overfishing, etc. The Atlantic is uh, something somewhat different from the Atlantic of 10 or 20 or 40 years ago. And this needs to be factored in to our thinking. I come from an Atlantic country. My office is, has a wonderful view. It's the best thing about the office, otherwise it's <laughs> It has a wonderful view. Um, looking out onto the estuary of the Tejo the River, the Tagus River, and, uh, and out into the Atlantic. And it's a daily reminder of the meaning of, of geography for a country such as mine. And, uh, and therefore, we have a very, very keen interest in working with the US to uh, ensure that the transatlantic relationship remains a, a very strong bond because there's a lot of management to be done in the transatlantic relationship. I mentioned, I mentioned uh, of course, access by, by Russia from the Arctic, from the Black Sea. But uh, China is increasingly uh, present in the Atlantic. And that's not going to go away. Final point. Uh, Africa. Um, Africa is a, country, a continent that is burgeoning in terms of population. It is a continent of enormous promise and enormous difficulties and dangers. It is a source of great instability, especially for the southern part of Europe, and, uh, and, and Portugal is included there. Uh, if we neglect it, it's uh, a source of uh, growth and, above all, of um, tremendous potential for the African population if, uh, if we manage to support uh, African governments' rights or if we manage to support the right African governments' rights. So there's a lot of work to be done with respect to that. And this is an area which I said I wasn't going to speak really about Portugal, but this is an area where Portugal uh, has a lot to offer. We have a lot of experience and a lot of presence there, a lot of interaction. And I think that um, uh, John said that uh, it wasn't, wouldn't be right to talk about what I'm going to talk about with Secretary Shanahan, but I can open that little door. I think Africa will be part of our conversation. So I just wanted to mention those, those six amongst many other potential topics of conversation and um, to say that these are issues that we're thinking about at the moment and, uh, and to once more thank you uh, for being here and for inviting me and to say that I'm open for any comments or questions you might have. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Minister. I, that was a great introduction to open up our conversation. I heard a few themes there as you were going through uh, your remarks that really speaks to the kind of ally that Portugal is for the United States and for other European countries. Um, you mentioned Portugal as an Atlantic power, looking at the North Atlantic, um, both in a European context, but also in a North American context. You talked about um, your role in NATO's southern flank, and particularly with regard to the North Africa and, and Afri the African continent. 
You're also one of the few countries that's a member of NATO as well as the European Union. So that's a unique role and perhaps your focus on uh, the future relationship with the United Kingdom in terms of security and defense is, is a result of that. The one thing that you didn't touch on that I consider part of the Portuguese brand, if you will, is multilateralism. Uh, Portugal is committed to multilateralism. You hold a number of important leadership posts at international organizations, currently the UN, previously NATO and, and the European Union. What do you say to those who are critical of multilateralism for being ineffective or too slow uh, or needing to change and, and possibly advocating bilateral solutions instead? Given the challenges you laid out, is there still room for multilateralism to, to be part of that solution? Well, my, my immediate uh, response is that if we look at those challenges, there are only multilateral solutions that none of those challenges will uh, really, um, it's the kind of challenge that will allow us to work in a, in a bilateral manner. And working in a bilateral manner on these, uh, I don't know if they're deeper, but certainly very pressing uh, issues relating to the governance of the transatlantic uh, region plus, uh, plus global governance, uh, requires us to be coming together uh, as, as groups of nations, or I didn't mention, except in passing, uh, climate change, or as an international community as a whole. So uh, I would say that undermining um, mechanisms of uh, multilateralism is sowing uh, problems for the future. The Chinese are perhaps not uh, instinctively multilateralist, but I think they have a good understanding that uh, their own interests can best be forwarded by, uh, by, by, by uh, I would say, tweaking them in order for them to fit into multilateral, um, multilateral arenas, institutions. And so uh, when the Chinese are working <coughs> on uh, climate change with the international community, uh, when they are actually reorganizing their whole economy, uh, to take into account climate change, it's uh, because the, they see that as a part of the planet, they have a lot to lose if, if, it doesn't, um, if they don't operate in this way. So although it's not so fashionable uh, at the moment, and although there is certainly a lot that can be done to strengthen, to make our multilateral institutions and mechanisms more, um, more effective, uh, I would say that uh, you know it's, we really don't have any uh, better, uh, better, better possibility. That's a great answer. So maybe moving on to NATO um, a, a bit, uh, because you spoke about adaptation of multinational um, organizations. NATO's done a lot in terms of uh, realigning itself to, to be more fit for purpose in terms of deterrence and defense. So things like the new adapted command structure, uh, the readiness initiative, efforts on military mobility are all addressing that traditional collective defense Article 5 uh, security challenge. How about in the South? I know that you've been, uh, Portugal's been very forward leaning in terms of what Dr. Hamry called this kind of 360 degree approach where you have uh, F-16s contributing to Baltic air policing, to the Black Sea. What do you as a southern flank ally anticipate in terms of steps uh, from NATO um, and even the European Union in terms of a southern strategy? Yeah, I think that uh, firstly it's essential that we should be uh, talking a lot about this amongst ourselves. We don't necessarily have the right tools uh, at the moment for operating in the southern flank in the way that our tools are not, were not developed over 70 years uh, with that in mind. I think NATO has done very well over the decades in adapting itself to the changing circumstances and creating uh, new tools and nowadays working on um, a whole range of new challenges that are quite unrelated to what was uh, in people's minds back in 1949. Mm. But, uh, but having said that, uh, NATO is, operates at the moment essentially as a military alliance with military uh, tools which are not always the most adequate. They are necessary as well, but they're not always the most adequate for the southern flank. The European Union, on the other hand, has a wider set 
uh, of tools, and I would say that there is a lot uh, that can be done in EU-NATO coordination. I would say job sharing, uh, but above all, uh, <laughs> identifying how we can take best advantage of each of the institution's uh, comparative advantages and, uh, in order to operate there. So it's not all about what NATO can do. Uh, it is also about uh, how NATO allies can think there, think through the issues in a manner that they can then bring to the table directly through NATO or through other uh, arrangements, uh, the, the, the tools that are necessary. So rather than a division of labor, you're talking about something that's more cooperative. So NATO doesn't, on the one hand, only do collective defense, or it doesn't replicate the EU, but finds a way to, to work together? Yeah, I, I would say that NATO has a lot of challenges now that are not direct, or rather they are related to new challenges to our collective defense, um, which are completely different challenges. Mm -hmm. the, the, the issues that we deal with when we're talking about um, 5G infrastructure, for example, are uh, issues that go to the core of new uh, whole of government, whole of society uh, challenges to, for, for the next few decades. And NATO so far does not really have the right kind of tools for dealing with that, but there's no reason why NATO's history is testament to its capacity to change. Um, and uh, there's no reason why NATO shouldn't develop that. What is important is that we should have the political dialogue inside NATO that can help us to, to see where we want to be uh, leading that, uh, that, uh, that institution. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, lot of work to be done at the moment in reconceptualizing both NATO and other institutions to a rapidly changing uh, new world we have here. Yeah, I think the good news is we have uh, started to make that adaptation. And, and as you said, the Alliance is very good at adapting. So now uh, we've got JFC Naples standing up and there's a lot of capability and capacity there for it to work together um, with, with the commands in Portugal and, and other southern allies. Um, staying on NATO a bit, how about uh, the, the North Atlantic? Um, do you think NATO is doing enough to look after uh, that corridor, both in terms of freedom of navigation uh, or in terms of access? Uh, what more could NATO be doing? And in particular, what is Portugal doing in terms of its defense goals um, to make sure, uh, as a maritime nation, that area is, is being looked after? Yeah, uh, taking the second part of your question first, uh, we, we are significantly increasing our maritime uh, capacity. So. Uh, we're increasing defense spending, but a disproportionate of that amount of that is going into maritime capacity. Mm. And um, uh, because there is a very clear understanding, I think, in Portuguese society that uh, we need to uh, be taking up our traditional, uh, traditional um, uh, theme of, of looking after the sea. And there are many reasons for that. And one of the reasons is actually that, that there are greatest, there's increasing sources of instability coming from the Atlantic. Is NATO doing enough? I think that NATO is now uh, paying more attention than it was five, seven years ago to the Atlantic, and I think that's a very positive thing. I think that um, there is, uh, all, there's always going to be some tension in NATO, given the very diverse geopolitical circumstances and histories of NATO countries. So mm -hmm. some are going to be saying, why are you going to be putting money over there? It needs to be, going, needs to be looking east, not west. But, uh, um, but independently of that, I think, to, I think that it, you do find that uh, in NATO there is increasing awareness now of, uh, of the Atlantic dimension. Um, it needs to be awareness, though, of a different kind. It's not purely military. You did mention some aspects that clearly have military dimensions, such as uh, uh, ensuring freedom of, of uh, navigation, ensuring the uh, security of our underwater uh, communications mm -hmm. cables, which, uh, given the digitalization of our societies, is a new source of, of vulnerability. But, um, but also, we need to be thinking about how NATO can be working uh, on issues such as uh, space. And there, the Atlantic is relevant. We have uh, the Azores Islands, uh, which, which, uh, where we're be beginning to make some space investments. Um, and also issues of uh, you know, bringing our allies together and thinking about how we deal with piracy in the Gulf of Guinea in the Central Atlantic. Mm -hmm. I think that 
you know, we talk about the North Atlantic with the NA in NATO, but the North Atlantic has got the far north, the Arctic, it's got the central parts, and it's got the Mediterranean Sea with black, all of these areas are areas of new challenges for NATO. You're, it certainly sounds like you're, you're surrounded by challenges. Um, maybe moving a little bit on to the European Union. We hosted the European Defense Forum here last week uh, together with the delegation. Um, and I would say that the dialogue in the United States in terms of European defense sort of ranges from, you know, cautious optimism about what European defense efforts within an EU context or European context outside of NATO might achieve to criticism. And you probably saw that there was a letter about, you know, the European Defense Fund and the non-inclusion of third countries. So how do we talk about NATO-EU cooperation and EU defense in a constructive way so it is additive to the transatlantic relationship? Um, this, is, this is a fairly new phenomenon and therefore it's always going to cause a certain degree of, of turbulence in, in the relations. But I think we've got past the worst. I think that a year or two ago uh, it was more complicated. I think that here in Washington there is a greater understanding that in Europe we don't want to create a, a, you know, a, a different kind of an Article 5 uh, organization. Right. Um, we want the US to be completely involved, engaged with Europe. I mean, there's no, no second thoughts about that. Uh, at the same time, for a number of other reasons, we want the European Union to have its own uh, strategic identity. And, and therefore, the challenge for us is simply to make it compatible. We have no other objective other than to make it uh, compatible. Then there are the commercial interests. Uh, these are going to come to, uh, to, to because there's going to be a degree of of, uh, of conflict over commercial interests, but that's the nature of our liberal capitalist societies, and uh, <laughs> I don't think that's such a, a bad thing. Having said that, also some of the topics, namely the ones that involve uh, a lot of innovation, uh, require require a cooperative approach. You know, I, I'm going to Le Bourget uh, Air Show in, in, on Monday, and meeting with Boeing there, and I'm going to be saying to Boeing, come to Portugal. Um, we want to be engaged with, uh, with US, uh, US, US industry, and uh, there's nothing contradictory with our commitment to the EU. Uh, there. Yeah, that was something that certainly came up at the Defense Forum last week, and I think the consensus was that, particularly in the areas of innovation and research and development, because supply chains were so integrated, because some of the defense companies are, are really multinational, that cooperation would happen on an ad hoc basis mm -hmm regardless of some of the rules and regulations that had been put in place. Um, so staying on that for a bit, you talked about strategic autonomy for, uh, rather than away from. What are some of the tasks that you would articulate for the EU to accomplish? Well, I think that uh, you know, we have to build on what the Euro European Union has been, where its strengths are, and uh, I said that we're can no longer be characterized uh, as a civilian power alone, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of uh, civilian um, characteristics that, that have been a learning process for the European Union, and that can be built, built on. In North Africa, we don't face military tasks alone. There are military dimensions, but uh, I would say that in North, in North Africa, there is a lot more that the EU can do as such than, uh, than, than NATO. Uh, in some cases, that will require also working with NATO in other countries, not in other contexts, not necessarily. But when we're engaging with, you know, rebuilding the judiciary or something like that, um, the EU is yeah. much better uh, equipped. Certainly, Portugal's been been doing a lot um, in in Africa. I was doing some research in advance of this, and, and your special forces contributions to MINUSCA are re, re, very admirable. A lot of countries operate with caveats in these difficult environments, and Portugal uh, does not. Um, you are often called to respond to threats in and around Bangui that and attacks by armed groups are increasing. Um, there does seem to be a lot of uh, instability there, uh, as well as in Mozambique. Um, we're hearing reports of increased IS activity. What is your, um, you know, what, what would you say is the outlook uh, for 
not just um, Minuska, but, but the region as a whole. Is, is there something more that's needed? Well, um, I think that obviously they're very uh, different challenges, and, and, but they're both very interesting cases which require a lot of attention from the international community at the outset, attention in order to identify what the problems are. And I would say that um, if you look at northern Mozambique, geographically close, more or less, or uh, within, within range of um, pirates coming down from Somalia, IS uh, operatives who have had uh, quite a lot of influence in Kenya, not so much in Tanzania, but then a little bit down the coast. But actually, when one looks at the uh, attacks that have happened in northern Mozambique, and there have been quite a few of them over the last uh, year and a half, two years, uh, it's a question mark in my mind whether the IS label has any real significance or whether it's just useful hmm. um, for the purpose, for, for, for immediate purposes. I suspect it's more related to the weakness of state control and a number of economic interests that are involved with mineral concessions and so on, um, rather than uh, any kind of jihadist uh, approach. The problem, though, is that it can start in a certain way, these dynamics can start in a certain way and then mutate and then gain traction as uh, um, some kind of uh, a new arena for Islamic militancy. And uh, so that's, that's something that we need to be very attentive towards. The same thing uh, can happen in, in, in parts of the Central African uh, Republic where we are, I've learned more about the Central African Republic than I ever thought I would <laughs> in the last few months and being in this uh, job. Um, and this is true in certain parts of the country. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we have some, another matter of concern, which is that part of the, the international community, and I'm thinking about Russia, there's no point in, yes. in, in, in being a coy, uh, is playing a role which is not uh, contributing to stability uh, in the country. So we need to have you know, a permanent member of the Security Council involved in giving a mandate to a MINUSCA actually uh, helping what MINUSCA is trying to do, which is to create the conditions for political settlement. At the moment, things are looking much better than they were six months ago. Uh, there is a political agreement. Uh, there is a new government that is bringing in different, uh, different factions. Um, but the capacity of the country, of the state, to extend its authority to, to, to the different parts of the country is very far away still. So I'm very proud of the work that, that uh, our troops have been doing in, in MINUSCA. They've really made a difference there. But uh, it needs to be sustained by the international community coming together. It can be sustained, um, but the more attention needs to be paid to the Central African Republic. It's, it's not even a small country. It's a big country. But in the African context, it's, uh, it's not a major part. But the point is that the uh, instability that can spread out from there, link up with instability coming down from the, the Sahel region, is, uh, is devastating for, for the whole continent and you know, for the population, the African population, which will then, of course, wish to go elsewhere, embark on uh, very dangerous journeys across the Mediterranean and so on. So you know, these, these are major um, f uh, incidents of cancerous incidents, as I would say, that we need to uh, work on while they are relatively containable. Yeah. That's an interesting dynamic you mentioned with Russia because if I, you know, among your six challenges, it, and it's natural that Russia would not appear on, on even the top 10 because of your geography and all the other challenges, but increasingly you're seeing this injection and overlap with what you're doing in Central African Republic and we've seen it in Afghanistan and elsewhere. So this really is com com compounding the nature of, of the challenges. Um, but hearing you speak, it's, and then I'll turn it over to the audience for some questions. Um, it's very clear that uh, you know Portugal considers its relationship with the Lusophone African countries and other Portuguese spe speaking uh, countries as a pillar of, of its foreign, foreign policy, its economic and security policy. Um, and so I think it's only natural to, to want to build on that. Um, I've heard talk of an Atlantic Defense Capacity Building Center in the Azores uh, that would really try to coordinate defense capacity building 
efforts and get not so much as at the response and the military solutions, but, but at some of the root causes. Is that something you can say more about for the audience? Yeah, this is um, uh, an idea that we're developing and that we want to hope we'll see the light of day before the end of the year, which is to uh, use un unused now uh, in military installations that used to be uh, US military installations for the, the largest uh, air base in the Azores um, for uh, for, for promoting uh, capacity building in, the, above all, the Gulf of Guinea uh, mm. countries uh, that are facing uh, great difficulties in controlling their waters. Uh, we have something like, uh, 2018, 40% of piracy incidents in the world took place in the Gulf of Guinea. The uh, indications from the first trimester of this year is that percentage is increasing. So that is a major focus now of, um, of, of danger for uh, a lot of international trade that comes, that comes up via the Gulf of Guinea. And, um, you know, I was with uh, the Ghanaian defense minister recently who was saying, you know, we've, we've got, uh, we're doing pretty well in our waters, but what use is it to do pretty well in our waters when there are no, you can't build a wall in the, in the ocean, you know, and uh, mm. our neighboring countries uh, have not got uh, capacity to fully control their waters. So we need to have a regional approach here. And that's uh, what we're hoping to do with the uh, defense uh, capacity building, uh, Atlantic uh, Defense Capacity Building Institution in the Azores. We, again, uh, something we want to engage with the US uh, about, as well as other Atlantic countries from the African continent, from European, and, and of course, from the Americas. Great, thank you. So we have about 15 minutes less left. I have more questions, but I, I don't want to uh, keep the floor from you. Are there questions in the audience? Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Lara. There's a microphone. Oh, sorry. Please introduce yourself. Hi. My name is Lara. Uh, I'm currently with Safety Foundation, but I lived in Portugal for two years. Uh, one of the questions I had was about Portugal's relationship with the Middle East. I've noticed a tightening of the relationship with the El Sisi regime in Cairo and your ministry. Um, anyway, if you could just speak a little bit about the security relationship with the Middle East and, um, and the, new, the growing bilateral relations with, with Egypt as well. Okay. Shall I go straight into that? Or? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, I was there a month and a half ago, something like that, two months ago. Um, uh, there, are, there are various aspects to it. You know, we, given our uh, dimension, uh, given our geography, uh, we're not going to have with the Middle East a uh, very direct bilateral engagement of our own. We, uh, we have an interest in um, uh, promoting defense industry contacts between Egypt and, and Portugal, and that's that's taking place, especially in the, in the naval uh, sector. At the same time, it was very useful to be able to listen to President uh, Sisi talking about dynamics in Sudan, in Libya, and, in, um, and also, in, also even in the Central African Republic. Uh, these are areas that are of interest to us. What's happening in Libya is, is a big question mark, and President El Sisi knows a lot about it. Uh, and so that was extremely, uh, for us, uh, it's very useful to be able to engage. Um, there are questions, you know, we don't have the same approach with respect to human rights as they do in, uh, as the government does in Egypt. Uh, but uh, that's the nature of international politics. You have to work with people who think differently. You know, they don't all think the way that we do. What we need to be able to do, though, is identify where the common building blocks that will enable us to make useful contributions to the bilateral relationship, make useful contributions to the regions in which we're engaging, and, uh, and there is no reason to abdicate from our, uh, from our own principles when we do that. Yes. Uh, I'm all right. Loud enough, I believe, okay. <laughs> I, I am the Turkish Defense Attaché, Brigadier General Kotash, and thanks for having me today here, and thanks for coming. I appreciate your highlights. I would like to turn attention a little bit to the our region uh, of Europe. Uh, 
everybody in this room is aware that uh, the U.S. is not very happy us happy about us uh, purchasing S-400 air defense system missile uh, defense system uh, from Russia. And in line with your highlight about uh, European identity, uh, everybody here is believing that the Turkish purchase, particular purchase, is undermining NATO's uh, integrity. Even our government highly declared and assured that we're not going to integrate this system with any of the NATO uh, radar systems. Uh, what, uh, if you would like to take your uh, ministerial hat, uh, and I would like to ask you as a, uh, a simple Portuguese citizen, uh, what's your take on this uh, approach? I mean, do you believe really that Turkey is undermining NATO in this regard? <laughs> Do you want me to answer for you? No. <laughs> I, I have to say that I think the simple Portuguese citizens don't have a view on this matter. <laughs> but uh, but uh, our uh, perspective is obviously, you know, we, we, we're not happy with uh, the tensions inside our uh, alliance. Um, and uh, Turkey is a sovereign country that makes the decisions that it believes are in its best interests. But uh, our view is that those are not the only possible decisions. And so there's an ongoing dialogue. Let's see, that, let's see whether uh, it is possible to have uh, compatibility between the presence of S-400 missiles and, uh, and NATO defense structures. But I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I don't think this issue is, is finished yet. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, we, as you know, we have not taken a particularly active uh, role in this uh, debate. We don't feel that this is an area where we have a comparative advantage, where we have a lot of specific uh, approach of our own that we can contribute to the matter. But we are a country that has a, a very good relationship with Turkey, both in our NATO relationship and also, as, as you know, in, in the uh, European uh, dialogue. So, uh, so we, we hope that it is possible for, for uh, the NATO, for Turkey to be a happy member of NATO, rather than uh, rather than to to be the focus of a contentious issue. Great. In the back, please. I'm Mary Godshall with ABC Imaging. I have a question about: uh, Do you think in Portugal there is any problem with fake news, Russian meddling in your uh, in the integrity of your elections? And um, if so, do you think there are, is a way that the EU or the U.S. could work together uh, on that issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't have much evidence uh, of uh, foreign interference in, in our elections. We have the traditional kind of fake news that is always peddled by politicians in uh, <laughs> electoral circumstances. But, but we don't have the kind, we haven't faced so far, the kind of... Um, uh, bot-led uh, propagation of uh, fake news that, that has been a factor in, in various other countries. Uh, but the instrument is there. We have no doubt that we are as vulnerable as any. And, uh, and of course, uh, we are concerned about uh, the integrity of democracies uh, around the world. And uh, so, yes, we do feel that we have a problem, although it's not an immediate Portuguese uh, issue. And I think that we, don't, uh, we have not been able to develop solutions that are adequate. The kind of solutions that have been developed so far um, go some way towards answering the issues, namely by uh, creating and enforcing codes of conduct amongst, uh, amongst the uh, platforms, the internet providers, uh, making them responsible for the kind of information that is the ghost, that is, the, 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 they're not simply uh, platforms where any kind of information can, can happen and they're not, uh, they have, for which they have no responsibility, they do have some responsibility. So that helps. Uh, it also helps to have, uh, as we've seen in a number of countries, um, you know, batteries of people whose function is to identify whether a piece of uh, news has a, a basis or not, whether it's a legitimate piece of news or whether it's just invented for the purpose of undermining. But those, those kind of approaches are uh, they're, they're inadequate uh, for the moment. And again, this is the kind of issue that uh, when we talk about NATO's future tasks, probably we are uh, going to be, have to be thinking in terms of the development of the right technological approaches to, uh, to, 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 
ensure that our electoral uh, dynamics are not affected by, by foreign interference uh, using these mechanisms. So I think there's a lot of work over the next few years to be done on that. Yes. Coming on the... <laughs> Hi, thank you, Minister. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Ya Wen, a reporter from the Shenzhen Media Group. It's a Chinese-based television. Uh, so you mentioned that the EU doesn't uh, follow the uh, the U.S. The, uh, taking a hard line against uh, China on the Huawei issue. So uh, to which extent you think that EU can resist on their voice on the Huawei and the 5G infrastructure issue? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't say the EU was going to be doing this. What I said was that it's fundamental uh, that our allies, United States and uh, you know, inside the EU and in NATO, that we be thinking collectively and discussing how uh, we should be looking at the challenges that China poses. And I, I was keen to underline that China is not the new Soviet Union. China is a country uh, that, on the one hand, offers a lot to the international community uh, in terms of global growth, in terms of its economic dynamics, but also technologically, in many ways, that China has a lot to offer in investment and trade and in global governance. However, uh, as the, uh, paper, the recent paper by the European uh, Commission pointed out, China also represents a systemic challenge. China has different uh, views on, on, uh, on the way the world should be in 20, 40, 50 years. Now, uh, this does not mean that we are inevitably going to come into a head-to-head -head confrontation with China. What it means is that we need to sort out collectively which manner we can best take advantage with China of the areas in which we agree and how to work through the differences that we have in manners that are satisfactory. For, for others. The question of Huawei, um, there are a number of technological aspects which I'm simply not competent to comment on, um, but that question, it comes a little bit further down from the bigger, uh, the bigger dynamics that we need to understand, that we need to be having a dialogue about before we can then say, you know, whether Huawei or whatever should be, or whether Ericsson should be allowed to operate the 5G infrastructure in China and so on. I'm not sure that's on the cards. If I could, if I could build on that question, because I, I like this balanced view that, that you present, um, particularly in a Washington that can just get very wound up in, in one narrative. Um, we do see the European Commission getting more involved in, in risk screening um, and just being more aware of some of the challenges that might be presented by, by Chinese investment. And that's mirroring some of the measures that have been in place in, in the United States and at a national level for some time. But how about a NATO role? Do you think NATO has a role in a China discussion or any sort of you know, response or deterrence? Yeah, no, I think very much that NATO is a good platform for dialogue uh, between the allies on, on NATO on uh, the issues relating to China. When we talk about China, we're talking about you know, the biggest, most obvious emerging reality uh, that is going to have an impact on global geopolitics in the next 10, 20, 40 years. So NATO can and should be talking about that. Uh, and it's doing it insufficiently, in my, my view. Uh, it is not sufficient to just take a particular issue of, uh, that is troubling us uh, and this, and in 2019 and say, this is what NATO should be doing with relation to China. No, NATO with relation to China should be engaging amongst the allies and with China in a much broader uh, dialogue. I think that's where we haven't quite got there yet. Yeah. I have heard this idea of using NATO's political arm to, to talk about China, but I like this idea of almost like a like we have a NATO Russia Council. We might even have a NATO China Council to that can include, even be more productive included in the discussion. Yeah. Uh, we probably have time for about one more question, if there are. Do I have a second chance? Sure. <laughs> uh, uh, it's not about Turkey. Sorry. All right. And uh, uh, thanks again for the second chance. Uh, 
uh, Portugal is uh, being uh, seated at the gateway of uh, Mediterranean. Uh, now Mediterranean has then uh, having more and more important uh, uh, value in the region because of the Syrian conflict and middle, uh, its closeness to the Middle East. Uh, and also there are some uh, trade uh, opportunities there because of the gas uh, to the southern flake of uh, Mediterranean. Uh, what's your take on uh, this uh, issue as well, being at the gateway of um, Mediterranean on the uh, west portion, let's say? Mm -hmm. And there was a question yeah. just behind you. Maybe let's take that and then you can answer both. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carol and I'm with the Canadian Embassy here. And I heard a talk yesterday on how the US is moving away from its traditional European allies, especially in its defense systems as well. Um, I'm wondering how can the EU and or the Western allies in general present a better case to the US to be a more attractive strategic partner and to kind of recenter that alliance back together. Hmm. It's a little broad, but. Okay. Okay. Um, perhaps I could take this one uh, first to, to say that, uh, you know, I think that the, bas the basic fallacy is to believe that we are only interested in, uh, in the US for the purpose of um, uh, bolstering our defense. I mean, that's major, it has been major for 70 years. But as we uh, Europeans, you know, look at an evolving global reality, and as we um, develop the, the notion that what happens in remote parts of the world are, is also of interest or has an impact upon us, we would like to be more engaged with the US in terms of thinking about global geopolitics. So the idea that the, US, the fallacy lies in this notion that because there is relative stability on the European continent, then Europe is of no, uh, no relevance. And come back to, to what I said right at the beginning, the US does not have better friends than Europeans anywhere in the world. And therefore, you know, we engage a lot with China, for example. We engage a lot with Japan. We've just created a free trade agreement with, uh, with Japan that is significantly increasing uh, our interaction with Japan. We're not, we're not in the Korean Peninsula, but it's not irrelevant for us. So uh, because of the increasingly densely interconnected nature of, of global politics, it would make sense for us to be uh, more engaged with the, with the US. And I think Canada um, plays, plays a very important role in that. I think Canada understands that well. We have great... A uh, great, very dynamic relationship with, uh, with Canada. Canada's looking uh, east and west at the same time, uh, and south, of course, uh, and north with the Arctic. So, They're like uh, Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, you know, I think there's plenty of, of potential there, and that it would be important for uh, all of us to, uh, working with authorities in Washington, to be saying it's not just about stopping the Russians from moving into uh, Europe. Although our La Latvian, Lithuanian, Estonian uh, allies are also concerned yes. uh, about that. With respect to the Mediterranean, the issues that you point to, um, underline that the, that the Mediterranean is an area of, it has been an area of increasing uh, contention uh, in, in the last uh, number of years. And uh, the fact that Russia now has easier access to the Mediterranean contributes uh, to that, not to mention you know, these tragic uh, situations that we've been seeing of people uh, crossing the Mediterranean in order to, 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 to reach Europe and boats sinking and so on. Um, and, and you mentioned the gas uh, issue, which is again uh, another matter of contention involving, involving uh, the European Union and Turkey uh, as well. So uh, the, the point here is that we need to have increasing presence in the Mediterranean of different types. And uh, some, we need to have an increasing military presence. We need to be using our military for traditional military purposes and 
also for civil protection capacities. Uh, and we need to be promoting dialogue because some of these matters are not solved by military uh, tools. Uh, and so the gas issue is not a military issue. The, the question of, uh, of the, the Syrian dynamics is going to go well beyond the military dimension as well. But in military terms, Portugal has increased in the last few years its uh, activity in the Mediterranean, in the NATO and EU uh, arena, namely with our, um, with our naval uh, forces. And we've seen that also happening uh, from other European countries. Well, thank you, Mr. Minister. I think we've used your time well, and your comments were very insightful. Among all the observations you made, I think perhaps the most important was because there's, just because there's stability on the European continent doesn't mean that the transatlantic relationship isn't still relevant. Mm -hmm. As we've proven today, there are really so many challenges where we need to stand by one another, and we really need Portugal to continue its central role in, in all of those. So thank you, and a round of applause for the minister, thank and you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.